Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. I'd like to start by saying that fundraising, whether we like it or not, is a part, normal part of life. From people knocking on your door or sponsoring somebody going into an event, supporting research into some disease, or just an organization that's doing good out there. Many good causes only go forward because people like us are willing to be generous and give. And I wonder, the questions I want you to think about is, um, when do you feel comfortable giving? And uh, what causes do you give to? How much do you give? And maybe more to the point, how does our faith affect how we give? What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, today we're going to look at a little tiny passage that's just chocked full of wonderful practical truth about giving. We're going to see that Jesus teaches to give sacrificially to the Lord. Now, it's not going to take long to get a sense of this passage, and yet I think there are depths here that we can draw out in three basic but profound principles that we're going to look at. What we're going to see, I hope, is heaven's perspective on giving, and from that, I hope we might change our perspective to be more in line with that. But before we begin, let's just give this time over to God in prayer. Father, we come before you now. We ask for your presence with us. Each one of us is coming from different places. Some had a tough morning. Some have had a difficult week. Some have concerns heavy upon their hearts. Father, may we trust you with them. May we set these things aside and sit before your word and learn what you would say into our hearts this morning. May we find challenge and conviction. May we find comfort, encouragement, and hope from what you say. By the Spirit, God, speak to each one of us. Speak through me, I pray. Give me boldness. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this story takes place in the women's court of the temple. That's where both women and men would be. And in that area, they had something known as the 13 trumpets. There were 13 offering boxes there that had tops on them like trumpets to drop into. Probably something like this picture here. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand why those offering box were designed that way, right? Uh, they didn't have paper money back then. They had coins. And when you drop in a coin into that trumpet, it would clink and, and make this noise as it slid down in. And the more coins you offered, the more noise it would make, right? And back then, the bigger the coin was, the greater the value. So bigger coins would make more noise than smaller coins. And plus, the kind of metal it was made of would make a different noise. And more precious metal is heavier. So gold would make a bigger thud than, say, copper. And so all of these things together would make quite a sound. And then they actually had benches set up by these 13 boxes so uh, people could go and watch and more importantly listen, right? This whole thing is set up to encourage people to give more. And as the crowd kind of oohs and ahs as they listen to the sound of those richer people that give a lot and the tinkling noise it makes. It's a little bit like the Emmys. I know that's a bit of a strange connection, but my head, when they roll out that red carpet and, and the actors go down, they, they show off their good looks, they show off their expensive, fashionable clothes. It was a bit of a show. Well, so is this. But the show here is of wealth, right? And Jesus sits to catch this show, which is odd because we know that Jesus in other parts of the Bible speaks against this kind of showy giving. And yet he's not here to watch the rich people give. He came to watch one woman who probably was hoping that no one would see her at all. We find out that this woman is a poor widow. And that makes her one of the most helpless and vulnerable people in the ancient world. And she drops in two small copper coins. Actually, the smallest coins there were the least value there were in the entire Roman Empire. She drops them in, they're worth just about a penny, it says. Now, together those two coins made up, uh, scholars tell us, about one sixty-fourth of what a general laborer would have made back then. So if you want to put that in modern terms, based on minimum wage around here, that the two together would equal about a dollar and 35 cents. And that shows us just how poor she was, because that is literally all she had to live on. Now, when I first read this, I thought to myself, well, that's not good. 
She's giving everything she has to live on. What's she going to do? Is she going to starve? How is she going to survive now? Now, you might be concerned with her along with me, but I want to allay those concerns, to soothe those concerns over, because Jesus obviously isn't concerned. Um, First of all, this is a free will offering. She isn't required to give this. No one is making her do this. She's chosen to do this. And we can imagine she's been in the temple, because this is in the temple. She's been worshiping God, and God moved her to give these two coins. She knows what she's doing. She's chosen this. And we don't really know her whole story. While she's very poor, she may have a family who, while poor, is able to at least feed her. But even if she doesn't, the Son of God saw her give her last two coins. And we can be sure that God is going to take care of this lady. Just in case you're worried that uh, the message today is going to be that you're supposed to give everything you have to the Lord, that is not the point of the story. We're going to learn from her attitude without copying her exact actions. And sometimes God does call people to give everything away. Think of the rich young ruler who, when Christ met him, Christ commended him to give everything he had to the poor and then come and follow him. Jesus said that because he saw that his possessions and his greed over them were holding him back from God. Sadly, he didn't listen. Then there are some in a more positive example, they give everything away and they serve Lord with their whole heart. We can think of missionaries, even like one of our missionaries, like Laval, who gave up an incredible job and considerable wealth to go serve in a dangerous and war-torn country to serve believers who are poor and uneducated there. A few are called to give up everything, and we should honor people who are faithful like that. And yet the regular experience of most believers isn't that at all. We, in fact, the Bible is full of Christians who are rich, and they don't give away their wealth. Now, they honor God with their wealth, and that's a slightly different thing, but they didn't give it all away. So instead, we're going to draw some different lessons from this poor widow, and the first one I want us to look at is a call to follow heaven's qualifications for giving. You might think, well, who should be giving? And first of all, that's what it's showing us, because this lady she gave as a free will offering as worship to God. And so giving is worship. That means that if you're not a believer this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, we don't want you to give, right? Uh, That would be hypocritical. You can't worship a God that you don't really believe in yet, right? And so that's one of the qualifications. Think about this too, like where do we give? Well, there were 13 different boxes. And what I didn't mention is that each of those boxes was labeled for different expenses and and costs within the ministry to pay for the temple. Some to pay for the daily sacrifice, some to pay for the oil, some to pay for maintenance, things like that. And we don't know which box this woman dropped her two coins in, but she put it in the one that God led her to. And so similarly, I think it's upon believers to give to the local church they regularly attend to help maintain their ministries. That's where most of your giving should go, but it's not the only place. See, God may move you to give into other ministries. There are more boxes there. It's okay to spread your giving across some of those boxes. There are Christian organizations that are doing a lot of good in this world out there. Like I think of um, the Pregnancy Care Center. I I think of Ambassadors for Christ. uh, There's a lot of good groups. Instead, you might be moved to give something to more compassion and care ministry that reaches out and works with the poor and disadvantaged. And that's a really good thing too. Maybe instead, God puts a particular country on your heart and you want to give to missionaries who are serving faithfully over there. Wonderful. Or maybe it's a particular missionary you just connected with. You thought, ah, that is a person I want to support more than just with my prayers. I want to give to them because I think they're doing such good work. Wonderful. It's especially good when it's one of our own. And we have a few who are missionaries even here in Toronto. And here I'm thinking of Mila, who serves for Toronto City Mission in Orton Park, working with disadvantaged children. And I want to commend to you Lily, who just this year has gone in full-time, not an intern, but full-time working for Toronto City Mission. And as a plug, she's not yet at 100% support. Maybe God will move you to give to her. My point is that along with your home church, some of the qualifications of where to give is there's many good Christian ministries out there. But more importantly than this, I think we learn a lesson that all of us struggle with when it comes to giving. See, we often feel that we should wait until we have a good deal of wealth 
before we give, or at least until we're financially secure. But the problem is, when does that happen, right? This world is full of all these major expenses. It starts out, you got to pay off your education. Then you got to buy yourself a car. That's expensive now. You need to get married. Weddings are costly. You need to get a house. Mortgages are terrifying. You need to also then when you get kids, you got to pay for them. Then you got to pay for their college. You got to prepare for your retirement. Very few of us are going to ever be totally debt free or having extra money, uh, bonus money on hand. Waiting for that to happen is just an excuse not to give. It's kind of like when I'd go to my kids when they were younger and say it's bedtime and suddenly they had all this stuff they had to do, right? Before they had to face that. Or it's like someone procrastinating over something difficult they don't want to face. And suddenly all these other things come up to deal with first and they never get around to it. See, this widow, she gave in the midst of a poverty that, that none of us here have ever experienced. And she still gave. So when should you give? The answer is you should start giving now. It's not about how much you give. It's about developing a healthy habit of worshiping God by giving back to him because everything we have comes from him, right? Let's be honest. Whenever we give to God, we're only giving back to him. He is the creator of this universe. It's all his. And if you're a believer, your life belongs to him, including everything you have. And so we should give to him. And when we give to him, it's a little bit like when a child gives to their father, they buy them a gift from the money their father gave them. And just like that father who will joyfully receive a gift that he actually paid for, so too our God joyfully receives from us what he's already given to us. And so what are the qualifications? A believer, you should give to good Christian ministries. That's giving to the Lord. And you should give regardless of your economic position. You just give because you're called to give. So we've looked at the qualifications, and now I want to look at heaven's accounting for giving. And I think this is really the heart of this passage. See, there is a divine exchange rate when we give to God that makes some gifts become more valuable and other gifts less valuable. God measures giving differently than we do. Most of us are impressed by large sums, and we think that if you give a lot, that must mean that you're very spiritual, and yet Jesus, he was sitting there, and he wasn't impressed by the, the loud crashing of all that gold going into the trumpet by the rich people giving. Instead, he thought that the one who gave least impressed him the most. The smallest amount was the greatest value in his eyes right? The least amount of money was the greatest offering. What's going on here? Is God just bad at math? No. He's using a different arithmetic. Warren Wearsby said that God doesn't count by portion, but by proportion. Maybe a little bit more clearly, we can say that God does not measure by sum, but by sacrifice. Those rich people, they gave huge sums, but it tells us they contributed out of their abundance. And so they gave, but they, they had so much they could hardly even notice the difference of giving, of losing what they gave. It's like when you see a starving person giving them the scraps off your plate, or you see someone who needs clothing and you give them the clothes that you're going to throw in the garbage the next day anyway. It's not a bad thing, but it wasn't costly to you. It wasn't a sacrifice. You weren't really going to use or miss those things anyway. Now hear me. It is still a good thing. Jesus does not criticize those rich people. He doesn't say they did something wrong. He only says they didn't give as much as that poor widow. There was no sacrifice in their giving, no tightening of the belt, no having to give up something they wanted so they could give more to God. And we have to ask ourselves a tough question this morning. Do we give God our leftovers and our hand-me-downs? You know, imagine a young man he has a girlfriend, he, he wants to spend his life with her, but he doesn't want to spend much money on her. And so he gets her an engagement ring, but he uses one of those old ring pops. I don't know if you remember those, uh, except he even eats it first. And he hands her the used plastic ring pop. Is she going to accept a proposition like that? Of course not. Is that because she's greedy? No. 
because we understand that sacrificial giving is an expression of love. The more you, sh you give, the more you show you value the person. And so a ring pocket, pop engagement ring would show just a, a lack of care and a lack of true love, right? And so our gifts to God should be costly. They shouldn't be easy for us to give. Maybe you need to cut back on going out to eat so often. Maybe you need to change your vacation plans rather than the expensive one to a more economic one. Listen to this. You actually live beneath your means so that you can have more to give to God. That sounds a little bit crazy, doesn't it? Because this world teaches us to be good consumers, to go out there and get lots of stuff, lots of new experiences, lots of luxuries, and they promise us that's the way to be happy. But look around yourself. Check the news. Look at people. This world isn't happy. It's messed up. Having more things is not the way to fix your life. In the West, we have never had more money than we do right now. And yet, believers, we are so unused to sacrificing. We're not used to living on less so that God's ministry can have more. We often live, if we're truly honest, decadent lives compared to our brothers and sisters around the world. We live in great wealth. And if God asks us to live in a little less of that wealth so he can have a little bit more, do we really have anything to complain about? What's more important, our comfort or the mission of this church to reach a lost and dying world? It reminds me of uh, one of the final touching scenes from that beautiful and disturbing movie, Schindler's List. Oscar Schindler was a German man who spent a lot of money trying to save Jews from being executed in Germany. And in this scene, as he's leaving the many that he saved, he can't help but be struck that he could have done more. He spent a lot of his money just on worthless things, on luxuries, on things that didn't really matter. And he's sitting there looking at the lives before him, picturing the lives that aren't there. He wonders and starts doing some math in his head, and he looks at his car, and he says, that could have been 10 people who aren't there right now. He looks at his little gold pin, and he thinks that could have been one more person who now has died. He did much, and yet he laments the fact that he could have done much more. What about us? There are lives hanging in the balance between heaven and hell right now. Will we one day look back and say, we did something, but we could have done more? See, why are we clinging to our things when something so much more important is in the balance here and on the line? Is your giving costly to you, or are you giving God the spare change of your life? Remember that by heaven's accounting, it is by sacrifice, not some, that our giving is measured. And one day we're all going to face a divine audit from God, and he will ask us to show what we have done with what he blessed us with. How will you, how will I fare on that day? Now, I, I want to point out that this widow doesn't just teach us about sacrificial giving, but um, she also teaches us that our giving is an expression of devotion to God. Because you see, she had two small copper coins. And it makes you wonder, why didn't she keep one of them, right? She had two of them. They're barely worth anything anyway. Why not give one to God and keep one for herself? Well, that's because she was all in. She was going to give everything away to the Lord. She shows us true devotion in her giving. In fact, that's the kind of devotion that Jesus calls from his followers, right? In Matthew 10, he said, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those are hard words, aren't they? And yet they're pointing to a deep truth. We have a great God. He has provided a great salvation. And so he is worthy of great devotion. This devotion includes even the closest of family ties. He doesn't tell us not to love our family. He says that he deserves our love more. And he deserves us to love him more than our money, too. We have to be willing to give whatever he leads us to give. To follow and trust him, not just with our souls and for our eternity, but with our finances as well. However, and this is really important 
This is about way more than just money, isn't it? Jesus is the Lord of our lives. And so our lives in all parts should be marked by sacrificial giving, not just in our finances, but in every area, every category of our lives. And that can be intimidating when you think about it, can it? I mean, finances alone are hard. Cost of living is going up. Houses are astronomical in Toronto. And all of us are feeling that, that financial pinch. And so giving in any amount is going to feel sacrificial. Even still, for many of us, money isn't the most precious thing we have, is it? Time is. We may have enough money to get by, but we feel like we never have enough time to get everything that we want done. Our calendars are more stretched than our bank accounts. Also, we're supposed to give our skills and giftings to God, and here we might feel poorest of all as we compare what we're able to do in ministry to God compared to some other people at the church and what they can do. We might wonder if our service will make any difference at all. And so as we consider giving of all of our lives to God, the truth is whoever we are, we're going to feel, we're going to feel poor in one of these categories of money, time, and service. In fact, most of us might feel poor in all three of them. And this is exactly where I think this passage has beautiful encouragement to offer to us this morning. See, that widow, she just gave her two little coins. It wasn't much, but it was all that she had, and she gave it freely and willingly to God, and to God, it was precious and wonderful. In Jesus' eyes, those others, they were giving so much more, and yet he valued what she gave because she gave what she could. In the divine exchange rate, as we give, we have to remember some gifts are considered more because of the sacrifice, not because of the sum, not because of what you could accomplish with your skills, not because of the great amount of time you can devote. It's all about the sacrifice. And if it is by su sacrifice, not some, it doesn't matter how much you give, as long as you give how much you can. Of course, we understand that we would see this passage very differently if we were to find out that that widow, she only had two little coins left because she'd spent it all the day before. She went out buying luxuries, partying, and wasting it all on herself on frivolous things, and then she just had two little coins, and that's what she put in. And I really think Jesus would have responded quite differently to her. That's not what happened. But in, we have to remember here that um, we need to consider as we feel like, how much can I give? We might need to look at our lives and look and say, am I spending my time on frivolous things? Do I need to make a little more time for God? Am I serving as I can or am I serving in lesser things when I can do more? Am I giving when I could actually cut back a little bit and give a little more? See, we might be able to find more, but sometimes you'll find that you can't. Sometimes you'll find that there's no more margin to squeeze out. You're giving what you can. You're simply maxed out, and that could happen. And you still might feel guilty about it because you look and see what other people are giving. You look at your little amount, and you say, ah, I have to find more. But if you feel guilt over that, that is false guilt. You shouldn't feel guilty when you're doing what you can. That widow, I imagine her kind of sheepishly going up to that and kind of dropping in, hoping no one would see her. If she felt that way, she didn't understand the perspective of her God, right? Because in Jesus' eyes, she was giving more than anyone else. And so we need to remember that it's not by some, but by sacrifice. And if you are feeling guilty because you're giving the best you can, but it doesn't measure up to other people, you are measuring wrong. Stop feeling guilty and instead feel God's pleasure. I want you to know that he smiles over such service. He loves your worship in giving back to him. So rejoice in his pleasure over you and stay devoted to a God who sees and treasures your giving because you're giving what you're able and that's all he asks. And that's a beautiful lesson. I hope you take that to heart. But if we're to follow heaven's qualifications and accounting in giving, I think as we give, we have to follow heaven's example and remember it. See, whenever we give, we should remember that Christ gave first and he gave more than we could ever possibly give back to him. He didn't hold back either. He gave everything. He gave his life to save us. And his death purchased, among other things, our forgiveness, 
It purchased our adoption into God's family. It purchased the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. It purchased an eternal future secure in heaven. Any one of those things is priceless. And if we were to try to pay him back for the rest of our lives, giving everything we could, we wouldn't even be able to begin to scratch the surface of the debt of love that we owe to him. And that's to say nothing of the daily blessings we receive. 2 Corinthians 8 says this. Let me get to it. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. See, he emptied himself, impoverished himself of the glory, the worship, the praise of heaven, and he came down into this world to live among us and face death and take our sin upon himself. It doesn't get poorer than that. And he did that to purchase us to himself so that we can enjoy him forever. And that is true riches. And that's what lays before us. And so if you've never received that, that is a gift that is open to you freely this morning through repentance and faith. All you need to do is confess your sinful need before him, turning away in repentance toward one who suffered on the cross to take the penalty for your sin. He died there so that you could live. And if you will receive him as Savior and Lord of your life, you can be saved. And then along with 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you can say, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You see, this really does fit our passage this morning, this idea of gift, because this woman gave all that she had to live on, it says in that passage, right? And that phrase, all that she had to live on, literally in the Greek says her whole life or living. And Jesus was watching her, and he was actually putting the spotlight on her in that moment. But he knew within the week, he would give his whole life to save us. He gave everything he had. Heaven gave its best when it gave us Christ. And we need to learn from the, that example of extravagant giving. And give the best of our, our resources, our time, and our service to glorify God and fulfill the mission he's given us to reach this world. Because giving is an outflow of a heart that is filled with gratitude to its Savior for all that we've received from him. And so, I call us to learn from the example of this poor widow and give sacrificially to the Lord. But in doing so, we follow heaven's qualification. And so we recognize that um, giving is a form of worship. And it supports God's ministry, and you give even in poverty, so believers, we must be giving. But we have to follow heaven's accounting of giving. We remember it's about sacrifice, not some, and so we give whatever little we can, knowing that God receives it joyfully. We give of our time, we give of ourselves, we give our service, we give our resources. And finally, as we do so, we remember that we are simply following heaven's example of giving. And we are giving back to the one to whom we owe everything. And so may God teach us, like that widow, to give freely and joyfully to our Lord, Savior, and King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, money sometimes roots in our heart, and any message on money can make us all very uncomfortable. But Lord, we pray that we would follow your example who gave so freely, that we would give of not just our resources, but our very selves back to you. Lord, if there's some here and they're being called to serve, may you move them to serve in the right area. If they're called to give, to give to the right um, ministry. And if they're called to uh, uh, give time, may they do so and, and be uh, consistent in their devotions, be consistent in their serving and encouragement, if not in public service, in private things, in hospitality. May we give of ourselves, Lord, because you have given everything to us. And we want to thank you for the inexpressible gift of our salvation. May its value be printed on our hearts. We've been worshiping you this morning, God. We seek to give back in our worship, and we seek to give back with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite